Uh, thank you, Michael and Damien and the Hausterkunst for this invitation. It's a unique opportunity for me. And uh, I wanted to just begin by uh, sort of elaborating on the title of the talk that Michael said a few things about it. Uh, we used to have the system of slavery where workers were owned and the slave owners themselves, the more intelligent ones, uh, made the point that what we really want to own is their labor, that we don't care to own their souls or anything else. We want a guaranteed supply of labor, which we can't get without this slavery system, at least in the Americas. And uh, it was eventually abolished. And the important thing was that it was aboli abolished as a voluntary system, that you cannot sell yourself into slavery anymore. And, uh, but what was substituted for it was the voluntary rental system. And so you have to think, well, what's the difference between a rental system and a ownership system? You rent a car, or you, you own a car, you rent an apartment, or you own an apartment. And the basic difference is the, uh, from the economic point of view, is when you rent something, you only buy a small segment of the services that the entity can provide. And whereas when you own it, you own the complete set of future services that it can provide. So that's the fundamental difference. And, and uh, so my calling at the rental system is trying to sort of jar people out of this uh, language uh, barrier they have. In America, we say we hire people, but we rent cars. And yet, if you just go to England, just look at the British version of uh, car rental, it's called a hire car in England. So the word hiring is used both for cars and, and humans in England. So calling it the rental system isn't a accusation. It's not something that's contested. And uh, my slide thing is working, yes. Uh, it is, it is, uh, uh, off a little bit. It is something that is agreed to by the uh, economics profession. And uh, so the quote I give you there is from Paul Samuelson, the, the, the um, premier neoclassical economist of, of his time, the first American to win the Nobel Pri so-called Nobel Prize in economics. And uh, he says quite clearly, since slavery was abolished, human earning power is forbidden by law to be capitalized. In other words, you can't sell it all at once. A man is not even free to sell himself. He must rent himself at a wage. And so the emphasis there on rent is also uh, in Samuelson's original. Uh, this recognition in the economic literature is not unique uh, to Sam Samuelson. Uh, here is another quote from a uh, economics book used in Europe, uh, which is actually a revision of a book used in America, uh, which makes the same point there. I won't uh, read it f uh, to you, except to note that the second author there is Stanley Fisher. And Stanley Fisher uh, was chief economist of the World Bank. He was a professor at MIT along with Samuelson, and uh, after the World Bank, he went and became the number two person at the IMF, and, and, uh, which is the highest an American can go at the IMF. Then he became the head of the Israeli Central Bank for a few years, and now he's the number two person in the American uh, Federal Reserve Bank. So he's had a stellar career, and so he's, this is not some statement by a marginal economist. This is from Stanley Fisher himself. So. Uh, that's just to justify the sort of terminology I'm using about renting human beings. Now, let's start to analyze the relationship a little bit of human rentals. And uh, the simple fact is, which we talk about from various angles, but that the people who work uh, in an enterprise, the employees and any working uh, employer, are de facto, are factually responsible. And this is the word responsibility when you say a person is responsible for a crime or is not responsible for a crime, you mean you're looking to the past. You're not looking to their role responsibilities in an organization role. You're saying, you know, who is responsible for doing this, for committing this crime? And, and in that sense, the, uh, all the people that work in an enterprise are responsible for the results. And the results have to be described. I, I use the, the usual uh, representation of the results of work that's common in the economics literature. And that is where you have positive and negative, that you don't create the product ex nihilo. You have to use up inputs uh, 
and you produce an output. So the net results or the total res whole results, shall we say, uh, production are that the people that work in the firm use up the inputs and in the process of doing so they produce the output. So the description of their results is what is, has traditionally been called the whole product and, and uh, what is in the economics literature is typically called the production vector or the production vector means it's got all these different components. And uh, the, the actual property rights that the descriptions of the capitalist enterprise are so steeped in metaphor that you have to sort of pause and say, well, what are the actual property rights that people have? And the actual property rights in the uh, human rental firm, the traditionally um, misnamed the capitalist firm, um, are that the employer owns 100% of the, uh, both the negative results and the positive results. Owning the negative results means you've got to pay off those liabilities, because you have liabilities and assets, expenses and revenues in accounting terms. And therefore, the employer gets the claim on also what is produced, and then sells it to get the revenue. So the employees have 0% liabilities against them for whatever they use up in the course of production, and have 0% of ownership claim on the output. So their role is exactly the role of a rented thing, as if you're renting a car or house. The, the car or the house can have no, uh, from the legal point of view, no responsibility for the result, positive or negative, and that's exactly the role that the employees have uh, in the firm in, in terms of the actual property rights. The, the, of course, the metaphor is that the workers get a share of the product and the the employer gets a share of the product and the suppliers get a share, but that's not the actual property rights. Those are, those are metaphors meant to obfuscate the real issues. <clears throat> so uh, what is the uh, source of the critique here is, first of all, I'll start with the notion of any number of rights. And the idea is, when I, when I say the, the workers are uh, still de facto, in fact, responsible for the results of their labor, the fruits of their labor, even though they're under an employment contract, it means that people cannot give up that sort of responsibility by signing a contract or by any sort of voluntary act, that they are inexorably co-responsible for the results of their labor. And then to, to do a little bit of intellectual history, this is also the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, a revolution of far more impact than the Russian Revolution in broad sweep of history. And the whole notion of inalienable rights as it was developed uh, in the radical enlightenment, both in Scotland and in Holland, not to mention in Germany, uh, was based on the, the uh, notion of the inalienability of conscience. And the word conscience is used in this context not to mean that sort of inner voice, but basically your most fundamental beliefs in, in religion. And, and uh, the idea was that you should not, uh, and in fact you cannot, simply take over your views from the priest or from the pope, that you have to, as it were, uh, verify them yourself, and you, you have inexorably that responsibility for your beliefs. You cannot transfer that to somebody else, to the, to the, the, uh, the pope or, or your, uh, the priest. And that was what was called the inalienability of conscience and, and very often forgotten. But that was the theme that was then developed into a political doctrine by Spinoza, by Hutchinson, and, and by the uh, German Enlightenment as well. So that's just a little bit of uh, history. And the, the uh, factual inalienability of conscience or in fact of any aspect that people have as persons is something that's actually well known in the law, and, and uh, that you, you, uh, the law fully recognizes when the employee, or in fact the slave, as, as Ms. Fumi uh, Okaji pointed out yesterday, that the slave was always under this contradiction, that when the slave committed a crime, then the law fully recognized that they were responsible persons then, that they had this capacity to have something imputed to them, in German, this is called Zerechnenkeit, the capacity to have something imputed to you, and the people cannot voluntarily give that up. They, you can't like turn yourself into a thing, even though the law may have a contract that has that effect, which is exactly what the human rental contract does and exactly what the 
if you had a voluntary contract for slavery, would do the same thing. So uh, I put in this quote here from one of the American abolitionists, William Goodell, that the slave who is but a chattel on all other occasions with not one solitary attribute of personality accorded to him becomes a person whenever he is to be punished. So the, this is not like some discovery that I've made that, that uh, people are always de facto responsible for the results of their actions when they're acting uh, in a normal way. And, and, um, and they, they, this is not something they can give up uh, voluntarily. So this is the fundamental insight behind the whole theory of inalienable rights. And you should notice immediately it has absolutely nothing to do with how they're treated or the wage rate or how much real income the slaves had or whether the slaves were beaten and all that. It was a theory that said that the contract to sell yourself into slavery, in other words, to sell yourself all at once is a bogus contract because it has the effect of turning you from the legal point of view into a thing, except when you commit crimes, but that that does not happen uh, in fact. So it, when you have a contract where the legal thing says one thing, but the facts are different, that's what's called a fraud. And so the, the contract, when it was validated for selling oneself into slavery, and it has been validated throughout human history until uh, the 19th century, it was in fact an institutionalized fraud. And my argument is exactly the same facts hold for the employment contract, the employer-employee contract, the human rental contract, because exactly the same facts hold for the uh, de facto or factual inalienability of responsibility. And uh, the slide there gives you exactly this quote from the literature on the employment contract. All who participate in a crime with guilty intent are liable to punishment, a master and servant. Master and servant's the older language uh, for employer-employee that was current in the, in the 19th century and uh, it was still used by uh, law books as sort of an anachronistic phrase. So this is a law book from the 1960s. A master and servant who so participate in crime are, are liable criminally, not because they're master and servant, but because they both jointly carried out a criminal venture and are both criminals. So in other words, uh, the, the, the sort of fraudulent contract to rent a human being is sort of set aside when you commit a crime and the law says, well, what were the facts? The facts are you're two responsible human beings, you cooperated together to commit this crime and you're both gonna be legally responsible for it. And so the major point of course is, well, what changes from those facts when you're not committing a crime? When, when instead of obeying the boss to rob a bank, you're obeying the boss to produce a widget or something else, the facts about responsibility are exactly the same. And, and uh, that's, the, that's the, uh, the, the point of the next two things, that the workers are not suddenly turned into machines or instruments when they don't commit crimes and don't suddenly burst into agency when they do commit crimes, they have agency the whole time that they are responsible beings. And uh, so the, the, it's the law that then changes because the law does not uh, intervene to hold a trial and to see what the facts actually were, and which is what the whole purpose of a trial is. And, and uh, the law says, well, the, the employer has paid all the cost of the enterprise, has, as it were, appropriated the negative product, and therefore the, the employer can appropriate the positive product. So the employer ends up appropriating the whole product, whereas, in fact, the, the antecedents to this argument I'm giving, which is called the labor theory of property, is that labor in the sense of all the people that work in the enterprise should have the, the right to the legal right to the whole product, this negative as well as the positive. And, and um, so you have this uh, fundamental violation of, of uh, their rights uh, in production, even though it's the result of a voluntary contract, as you, as you would in slavery if, if it were in fact established in a, in a voluntary way. So, uh, where are the roots of this history? I'll, I'll get around to criticizing Marx in a minute, but uh, if you go back to the uh, origins of social democracy in Europe, there's a lot of uh, envy now on, on the European left that, that uh, we want to be like a Nordic social democracy or something. But uh, if you go back to the roots of even Nordic Scandinavian social democracy, Go back to Ernst uh, Wigfors, who, who was the, one of the founders of the Swedish 
uh, social democratic movement, he had a much more radical analysis than actually uh, survived in the programs of Swedish social democracy. And, and if you read the quote there, you'll see he has exactly the same critique of the employment contract, that the human labor cannot be separated from the worker, that you cannot, you know, when you, when you rent a, a, a car, if I own a car and I rent it to somebody, I can turn it over to them and they can use it independently of me. If I own a, a wrench, I can rent it to someone and I can turn it over and they can use it independently of me, but I cannot do the same with myself. So the whole idea that labor responsible human actions can be bought and sold uh, is in fact a, a legal fiction, a, a fraudulent uh, contract. And uh, Vigfor said this, this is in 1923 and, and one of his, uh, uh, yeah, there was a Vigfor Commission on Industrial Democracy in 1923 and you can read it there yourself. But uh, he clearly uh, had this analysis and uh, we'll get in a minute as to why has this analysis been forgotten uh, on the left. Another example of this uh, in annual bill, the argument is, is a more recent uh, person, a good friend, uh, Carol Pateman, who makes exactly these same arguments, uh, both from a uh, point of view about the employment contract and from a point of view about feminism, where the relevant contract is the coverture marriage contract, which was the marriage contract up to the early 20th century in most of the Western countries, still is, of course, in, in uh, much of the Middle East. And, and uh, Carol uh, makes, makes exactly the same argument in her feminist classic book, The Sexual Contract. <clears throat> the answer to the question of how property in the person, in other words, human labor, can be contracted out is that no such procedure is possible. Labor power, capacities, or services cannot be separated from the person of the worker like pieces of property. She's not saying wages are too low, workers are exploited, they're overworked, they can't go to the bathroom very often. She not, it has nothing to do with it. It's a fact about human labor that, that the person cannot turn themselves into an instrument, a tool, simply by in any way, shape, or form to satisfy this contract, which has exactly that effect. So it's a much deeper critique than the left is, is used to seeing, and it's been there all along. It was there in Vigforce, it's here in Carol Pateman, and uh, you know I've been saying it for 40 years as well. So that's the history that I want to now uh, look at why is the left so screwed up. And um, the, the uh, one way to see how screwed up the left is, is to go back and read some of John Stuart Mill writing in the middle of the 19th century, in 1848, for example, and uh, you, there's a lot of things in Mill you can criticize, of course, his, his colonialism, work for the India office, and so forth, but uh, he made it quite clear that the famous passage in, in his Principles of Political Economy in 1848, that if, if humanity is going to continue to improve, that the, the form of industry that will prevail in the end is labor hiring capital, labor electing management, and labor uh, being the members of the firm, in other words, what today we would call a worker cooperative or a, a uh, worker-owned firm, workplace democracy. And to say that, I mean, try to find an economist, a standard economist today who would say that, that, that if, if uh, even Bernie Sanders couldn't bring himself to say it. And, and uh, this is in 1848. So what happened between 1848 and now that the left lost track of this whole line of argument and of course the answer is Marx, Lenin, and the Russian Revolution. So uh, the, the uh, which completely, uh, in, in, this is sort of my basic thesis here, is, is that they set back the left a century, a century, essentially a century, or a century and a half. And, and that, so we are just now beginning to come out of this, this uh, uh, time in which, in which Marxist-Leninism provided the alternative and thus gave capitalism a free ride and beginning to recreate the arguments that have been there all along that are not, have nothing to do with the Marxist critique or the supposed uh, superiority of uh, what was created in the, in the Russian Revolution. So the debate is not about whether workers should be employed privately or publicly. I, you can make a joke, this is sort of like a, the Cold War was like the Peloponnesian War between Sparta, which had publicly owned slaves, the Helots, and Athens, which had privately owned slaves. And uh, 
And so the, that's been what the debate has been for the last century, the century that we're here to commemorate and certainly not to celebrate. And, and uh, that has given the, the uh, defenders of capitalism this sort of free ride by saying, well, that's the alternative, is, is just everybody's working for the state and, and, and instead of being privately employed. So uh, Marx didn't get anywhere near that. And uh, the, to put it bluntly, Marx had no theory of inalienable rights. So he had no ability to criticize the, the contract to rent a human being per se. He had to criticize the terms of the contract. This is not to say that he wasn't in favor of abolishing wage labor. Of course he was. But I'm saying, what was his theory? It takes a theory to kill a theory. And, and uh, he had no theory of inalienable rights. In fact, he ridiculed inalienable rights in, in various points uh, in, his, in his writings. And uh, he had no theory of property. He had no labor theory of property. And, and uh, other people at the same time, of course, did. Uh, people like Proudhon, people like Thomas Hodgkin uh, in England uh, developed that theory. And of course, Marx had no theory of democracy, uh, that then, and uh, not to mention democracy in the, in the workplace. So just to l focus on one of those points that Marx had no theory to criticize wage labor per se, as opposed to simply saying the workers aren't paid enough, I give a quote here where, from Marx uh, where he's talking about the difference between the normal working day and overtime. And uh, he wants to say uh, that if, even if people are not exploited during the normal uh, working time, whatever that was, they could still be exploited in overtime. And so you can read the quote yourself, but the key part, the emphasis I've added there is that they would still be exploited uh, in overtime even if the, the labor during the normal day was paid its full value. So if you're talking about labor paid its full value, your, your, your theory of exploitation just goes out the window because it means you're not arguing for the abolition of wage labor, you're arguing for paying it for its full value. And that's what's called superficial. That's a superficial theory. That if you paid workers more, and presumably when they're working for the state, they would be paid more, then that's not a critique of wage labor per se. So it's not a matter of, of, oh, Marx is too radical. No, Marx is too superficial. And in American slang, we would say that Marx brought a knife to a gunfight. In other words, he, br he tried to uh, develop the labor theory of value and uh, ultimately failed. Even if it had been a good theory of value and exploitation, it would have only been that and not a critique of, of the whole uh, system of wage labor, which is part of the system of property and contracts. So you've got to know how to analyze a contract, which is what the abolitionist movement did, which is what the feminist movement did vis-a-vis -vis the coverture marriage contract, and Marx had none of that. So he brought a value theory to a property theory fight, and uh, thus was inherently uh, failing. And, but let me, let me say uh, uh, that, that this is, in a sense, a compliment to Marx because um, the, 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 there's a, this is sort of a digression, the German, famous German physicist at the turn of the early 20th century, Wolfgang Pauli, was known for his acerbic tongue and, and he was one of the developers in the early 20th century of quantum theory which was a huge uh, intellectual mess and it still is. People don't know how to interpret it. So uh, people would give Pauli their papers uh, to, to, for his comment and uh, he would look at them and he would say, well, this is wrong or this is wrong. But then some of the papers he would just throw and he said, this is not even wrong. So uh, that phrase has caught on. And most of uh, theory of the left, I would have to classify as not even wrong. Whereas Marx was wrong. Marx was a great theorist in a mind that just blew out all the other people like Proudhon and Thomas Hodgkin and others who weren't in it, had it nowhere near his systematic uh, ability to theorize. So when I say he's wrong, that's a compliment. That, that's saying that, that uh, uh, he was able to develop a theory that was coherent enough and uh, the mathematics to develop it as a mathematical theory was not there in the 19th century. It was developed in the 20th century and, and the Marxian labor theory of value and exploitation was eventually formulated mathematically by Okoshio and Morishima. Uh, 
and, and then one could see very clearly how superficial it in fact was. But that's not the worst of Marx's mistakes. That's where Ma Marx, somebody had to develop the labor theory of value to see if it had the potential because when Marx lived, you know, he had that from Ricardo. And, and so let's see if he, and Marx did and he failed, but, but so he was wrong, but he was uh, much better than being not even wrong. Where Marx really got it wrong was the whole analysis of private property. And, and uh, there, uh, one has to go back to see what was the origin of his idea of private property. And, and there you have to go back to the Middle Ages and, and uh, uh, the Middle Ages were not happy peasants working on the commons. The Middle Ages had a thing called feudalism. And feudalism was where the, the control of the uh, people living on land and working on land was all part and parcel of ownership of the land. So what today we call the landlord was in that day called the lord of the land. And it was all tied together so, so that the, the, if you lived on the lord's land, uh, he owned the fruits of your labor, uh, he was your, your political governor as well, and so all these things were tied together uh, in the ownership of land. And this is all quite clear, for example, in Otto von Gerke, the great German legal historian, as well as in Maitland or other, other legal historians about the Middle Ages. Marx made a huge mistake. He just substituted capital for land. He thought that, that, that all that was attached to capital, and that's sort of this Marxist notion of capital. So therefore, if you want to condemn the capitalist production, he, he thought you had to eliminate private property. And that gave the capitalist system this incredible century-long free ride to be able to pose as, as the defenders of private property when in fact the whole capitalist system is based upon appropriating the fruits of the labor, positive and negative, of workers, the very basis for private property appropriation. The only legitimate basis that's ever been proposed is getting the fruits of your labor, which doesn't apply to land, because land is not the fruits of anybody's labor. It doesn't apply to natural resources, but it does apply to the products of labor. And, and by condemning Marx through this mistaken analysis of, 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 of capitalist production, thinking that capital was just going to be substituted for land, that, that uh, uh, he had to condemn private property. And uh, so the, the, uh, the employers, the so-called capitalists, are, are allowed then to, to uh, appear in history as, as the defenders of private. And this is like, uh, I think I have a slide here on this. It's like uh, people who, the whole system is to violate human rights to be allowed to pose as the defenders of human rights. And, and uh, so the, the, uh, the, the point here is, is that this is what has allowed this century and a half of the left to be wasted. And, and for things that John Stuart Mill said to still sound radical today is because we gave it a free ride by the Marxian analysis that said, you know, we have to abolish private property and, and uh, substitute a system for everybody working for the government or society as institutionalized in the government. And uh, that's the alternative to being uh, privately employed. So uh, the approach that uh, we are trying to uh, propose now is how to reconstruct the narrative on the left that's entirely free of this past so that we don't continue to be pushed into this role of having to say, well, you know, Marx made a few mistakes or Lenin made a few mistakes or, or uh, gee, we're sorry that once you combine economic and political power that the most murderous psychopath like Stalin will get control and we won't do that. No, we, we have to completely change that narrative, which means going back into the history of Western thought, going back into the abolitionist movement, going back into the democratic movement, the feminist movement, to reconstruct these arguments, inalienable rights arguments, labor theory of property arguments, democratic theory arguments for democracy in the workplace, and to rebuild the left on that basis. So that means uh, the argument for the abolition of renting people based in the, in the name of inalienable rights and in the name of private property, which would be very difficult for most of my left-wing friends to, to say, uh, switch around like that and say, well, it's in fact in the name of private property that we have to abolish uh, the capitalist production, something that Proudhon said for a long time. When Proudhon said that property is theft, he of course meant the old system, and he talked about property once purged by justice, and of course, for democracy in the workplace. 
So the alternative is where you uh, don't have any institution for renting human beings, just as we don't have any institution today for owning other human beings, or we don't have any institution today for the coveture marriage contract by which women give up their independent legal personality in a marriage. Though all those contracts have been abolished, and uh, the argument here, what's called neo-abolitionism, is to abolish uh, the rental contract. That means that all the people that work in an economic enterprise would not only have the de facto responsibility for the positive and negative results, but would have the legal responsibility as well. They would be the members. The, the appropriations is, of course, joint in the enterprise, but they would be the legal members of that legal entity. And uh, just to give you an example of a totally non-Marxist, this, this is a, uh, a Tory uh, minister of education. And, and uh, when do people think about different social systems is, is after wars, when you have to reconstruct after wars. And so in 1944, Lord Eustace Percy, who was a, the Tory, uh, he was a writer and, and minister of education, said, here is the most urgent challenge to political convention ever offered to the jurist or the statesman. The human association, which in fact produces and distributes wealth, the association of workers, managers, technicians, and directors, is not an association recognized by law. So this is the group that I was talking about, the group of people working in an enterprise who in fact have that de facto responsibility. That association is not even recognized by law, as Percy points out. <clears throat> The law, the association which the law does recognize, the association of shareholders, creditors, and directors is incapable production. So far from people getting the, produce, the products of their labor, this, the association is in fact recognized as the firm, and the, the corporation is not even capable of production, the, the people that are considered the members or the owners of the corporation. And the law does not, is not even expected by the law to perform these, these uh, functions. We have to give law to the real association and withdraw you know, this privilege from the imaginary one. So here's a Tory you know, in 1944 laying it out. And, and, and uh, so why is all this, what I gave you before from Big Force, why I g gave you from this Tory thinker, why is all this swept away? Well, I said it before, that the, the left has been set back at least a century by Marx, Lenin, and the Russian Revolution. and we're trying now to uh, dig out of that hole and create a new future uh, for the left. So the alternative is when this association of people who work in the firm are, when it, that's recognized, then labor will be hiring capital instead of the owners of capital renting people. <clears throat> and, and then the people would get the positive and negative fruits of the labor as the labor theory of property. The firm would be a democratic uh, community. It would not have owners, it would have members, and, and uh, would be members by virtue of the fact that they work there. And uh, one of the best examples of that today uh, is the Mondragon cooperatives that people may have heard about, which are very real, and as any real human institution have, are full of flaws, but they're one of the best things around uh, to represent uh, these ideas. And, and uh, that this vision of uh, abolishing wage labor in favor of the cooperative commonwealth, this is the 19th century, uh, the labor movement in the 19th century had this, this goal before uh, the, the rise of just the ordinary business unions that said we will accept wage labor and just try to collectively bargain for more and more and more within that, coupled with the, the whole Russian Revolution, and uh, which sidetracked the left uh, for over a century. So the book mentioned uh, by Michael before, uh, this is on my website. Uh, it was published back in 1992 and the publisher disowned it within two years and wouldn't even put it in the catalog. So I demanded the rights back and got them back and so it's on my website and the website is right there. So thank you very much. <laughs>